Hello, welcome to the MR Ultrasound Fusion Guided Biopsy course. This talk will focus on prostate imaging, what a urologist needs to know. You'll get the basics on MRI interpretation, what it means to segment, target, and localize these regions to show to your patients as well as do the procedure. Before we begin, we always have some disclaimers. This course is for educational purposes only. It allows our physicians to review the material after attending one of our hands-on courses. It is not to be used to direct patient care or a substitute for actual hands-on training. Multiparametric MRI imaging is the foundation for an MR ultrasound fusion guided biopsy. The evaluation of the patient for suspicious lesions and then targeting these lesions results in no more blind biopsies. Blind biopsies is a colloquial term, however, it refers to the sampling limitations associated with standard 12-core biopsy, especially in patients with prior negative biopsies. If you continue to repeat the same biopsy, the cancer detection rates go down. However, if your MRI is positive, the cancer detection rates are increased. Also, targeting specific areas to improve sampling, especially in men that have been found to have low-grade, low-volume disease, not all of them are candidates for active surveillance, and multiparametric imaging can help. Also, if we can target these areas, we can also possibly treat these areas. That is called focal therapy, which we're still investigating. Looking at transrectal ultrasound, how is it typically used? Well, traditionally, we use it to place the needle within certain regions of the prostate to sample adequately, spread the needle around. However, we like to look for suspicious areas. These hypoechoic areas that are seen here, there's many of them. Some are hyperechoic that could be cancer as well. So the sensitivity and specificity is limited. If you continue to biopsy all these areas, you'll be taking many more than 12 cores during your standard biopsy. That is where MRI imaging helps. Well, one specific fact you must remember, garbage in equals garbage out. This refers to the quality of your MRI imaging and its interpretation. It is extremely important that this is the area that you focus on in the beginning. You need to have feedback from your biopsy results to help your radiologists improve their ability to interpret the scan, call things positive and call things negative. This is an example of an axial T2 weighted image of a gentleman who had two prior negative prostate biopsies. If you look, there's an area on the anterior left portion of the screen here that has a low signal intensity on T2 weighted imaging. What's the reason that he had two prior negative 12 core biopsies? The needles don't typically reach to the anterior portion of the prostate or the top of the prostate away from the rectum. Some of the keys to having a successful program is understanding that MR imaging quality is not all created equal. You should understand that even images from the same magnet can be different. Understand that these images can be tweaked and honed over time to improve their quality. Every program when beginning should have a pre-biopsy setup. You should have a review where you sit with a radiologist and go over segmentation and targeting for the procedure. This helps you become familiar with what the lesions look like and how to approach them regarding a transrectal or transperineal approach. During the procedure, understand the different techniques and tips and tricks to obtain good fusion and perform a targeted biopsy. And probably one of the most important things is the post-procedural review. Look at the video of your procedure. Record the procedure to look at it. Did the prostate deform? Did you miss the target? And then you also sit with a radiologist and a pathologist and go over your results. And this together can combine to have a high quality program and high quality results that you and your patients expect. How do MR ultrasound fusion systems work? Well, there's three components. First is your MR imaging, and then the technology to combine the ultrasound images with the MRI images is based inside the fusion machines. And this allows for your targeting and tracking of all biopsies during the procedure. This is an example of fusion. Essentially, the MRI and the ultrasound are overlaid together. You combine the benefits of one imaging modality with another. MRI has a high sensitivity and specificity for detecting prostate cancer. And ultrasound is available in the urologist's office, allows for temporal resolution or real-time imaging of the gland which combined allows us to guide, track, and record biopsies in 3D space using the tracking platforms. This is an example of surface rendering. 
See those small triangles overlying the surface? Each one of those triangles is different. Well, if you have a data set from your MRI and you have a data set from your ultrasound or the surfaces of both, you want to combine them and match the triangles. This is a simplified example. On the left, you have two image data sets, image one and image two. Notice how they're not aligned. Well, after registration or lining up the squares or the triangles, you're able to put the two image data sets together. Well, the difference between your intended target and the actual target is target registration error, or TRE. These are very specific details about fusion biopsy. Most urologists don't have to know, but it is under, it's important to understand how the technology works. So if you take a very good ultrasound image that's able to be combined with the MRI, and if you don't have good segmentation in your MRI, the quality and the performance of your biopsy machine may be decreased. Here are some common terms associated with MRI imaging. First of all, Tesla or field strength. The higher the number, the higher the signal to contrast ratio. And it's been found that three Tesla does outperform 1.5 Tesla in multiple publications. The next is the endirector coil versus no coil. An endirector coil has a five to 10 times increase in signal detection during the MRI. If signal is currency, the MRI with an endirector coil does have higher quality images obtained. But that's not just it. You should understand what is in the balloon. Even if you use a coil, if someone uses a coil with air or demineralized water, they can get a poorer quality image than if they compared that to someone that had fluorine or barium in their balloon. Also, what sequences are being obtained? I'll go over this in detail later in the talk. Types of surface coils. What's the number of coils per area? As we change and technology evolves, this is not so applicable now. However, we typically use the 16-channel anterior cardiac coil over the pelvis to obtain higher quality images. And always remember when to obtain the MRI. If you performed a biopsy, you should wait at least six to eight weeks if you're screening these men for an undiagnosed lesion. This does not apply if you're doing this for staging for surgical or other treatment. A multiparametric MRI should include two groups of sequences, anatomic and functional. The anatomic is a triplane, sagittal, axial, and coronal T2-weighted images. While the functional refers to diffusion-weighted imaging, dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, and in some cases, some people perform MR spectroscopy. This is an example of the case I showed you earlier. However, the remaining sequences are shown here. In the left upper corner, they have the T2-weighted sequence. On the right, you have dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. This is a color overlay showing an increased uptake in this left anterior lesion. In the lower left corner, you have the ADC map, which is a parent diffusion coefficient, which shows an area of restriction as dark signal, as you see here. And in the right is a color map of the same process, outlining the ADC value seen within the lesion. This is an example of the anatomical sequence, a sagittal, axial, and coronal reconstructions of the T2-weighted images. Each one of these sequences are obtained independently. And we find it helpful when a lesion is present in both sequences, you really increases your confidence in calling this a lesion. And we typically like to look at multiplanar T2-weighted images during our diagnostic process. Diffusion-weighted imaging looks at the Brownian motion of free water within tissues. If you look at the image on the left, there's really no restriction. As you increase the cellularity, you see the vectors of the water motion is decreased. This has been shown to associate with increased cellularities, the water path is interrupted, and therefore associates with prostate cancer's increase in cellularity as Gleason score increases. What is a B value? This is a commonly used term associated with diffusion weight imaging. Simply put, this is a threshold which is set when obtaining a diffusion-weighted imaging. The threshold means anything that has a restriction below the B value does not show up as a high signal. Essentially, it's raising a filter. So things that are very restricted, like prostate cancer, can show up as you increase your B value. Typically, three B values are used to create an ADC map. This can include 50, 500, 1,000, and 1,500, which is what we use at the program. However, it does vary from institution to institution. And the common question is, the ADC maps that are created from the diffusion-weighted images, do they correlate with prostate cancer histopathology? 
Well, they do, and I will cover that a little bit later in the talk. What is an apparent diffusion coefficient map, or simply put, an ADC map? Essentially, this evaluates the slope of the line created by the different B values in the diffusion weighted imaging and creates one composite image sequence to review. And these image sequences show up of areas of low signal. ADC maps can be evaluated, and if one removes the B0 value, can decrease the T2 shine through, which could impact your diagnostic potential of the study. However, also increasing and using B values greater than 1,000 can improve the diagnostic potential of these studies. What is this? Well, this is an example of a diffusion weighted imaging with different B values. 0, 188, 375, 563, and 750. But what are we looking at? Well, this is 0, so essentially this is a TT weighted imaging. As you increase the B value, notice how the signal or the brightness of the image decreases, except for one area. See this area right above my pointer? That stays bright the whole time. That is an area of increased restriction. An ADC value is the slope of the line created from the diffusion weight imaging at different B values. And an ADC map itself will look like an area of low signal or dark spot on the ADC maps that you can review. Looking at the impact of the ADC values, a study from the NIH found that as the ADC value decreases, there's an inverse relationship with increasing Gleason scores as well as D'Amico risk stratification. This makes sense. As you become more compact or denser, more cellular tissues, similar to an increasing Gleason score, this also equates with diffusion weight imaging or increased restricted areas within the tissue. This is a simple example. Looking at Gleason pattern 3, which represents almost normal cellular architecture within the prostate except for staining of the basement membrane, is not as restricted as if you move through Gleason 4 and up to Gleason 5, which becomes more restricted, equating with lower ADC values. The next functional sequence that we're evaluating is dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. There's two ways to look at this, as a qualitative assessment or a quantitative assessment. The qualitative assessment is early arterial enhancement, which prostate cancers usually show early and rapid enhancement with early washout. The quantitative effects can be characterized as K-trans or KEP, which I'm not covered in this portion of the talk. We also use enhancement curves, types 1, 2, and 3. Here are the three types of prostate enhancement curves, types 1, 2, and 3. Type 1 is associated with normal prostate. Type 2 has an earlier arterial enhancement without early washout. Type 3 has been shown to be associated with prostate cancer. A recent publication from the NIH group in JAMA reported level 1 evidence of MR ultrasound target biopsy outperforms the standard 12 core biopsy. It finds 30% more high risk cancer and 17% less low grade disease, which is part of the problem with prostate cancer of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Typically, at 12 core biopsy, 70% of the patients diagnosed have low grade disease. They then correlated these findings in these patients with whole mount histopathology after radical prostatectomy. And they found an accuracy of 77% compared with a target biopsy compared to 53% in a standard biopsy. Dr. Panabianco's group from Italy reported on a randomized controlled trial in a group of over 1,000 men. These men had elevated PSAs higher than four, abnormal PSA densities, and an abnormal PSA velocity. They were randomized into standard biopsy or undergo a multiparametric MRI before biopsy. In their cohort, 77% of men had a positive MRI. If they had a positive MRI, 93% were found to have prostate cancer. If the MRI was negative, the cancer detection rate was only 28% and a majority of those were low-grade disease. Looking over to the left side of the screen, patients underwent a standard biopsy. The cancer detection rate was 36%, which is typical what we find in our ultrasound-guided biopsy cohorts. In the group of men that had a negative 12-core biopsy, they then underwent a multiparametric MRI. If their MRI was positive, the cancer detection rate was 87%. 
patients with a negative MRI then underwent a saturation biopsy and the cancer detection rate was 29% and the majority were Gleason 6 disease. Using the data from the previous two stated studies, a new paradigm is starting to exist. Our previous paradigm, all men with an elevated PSA underwent a 12-4 biopsy. However, patients and other clinicians have the idea that if MRI is used as an intermediary step to select men for biopsy or not, it may decrease the number of biopsies being done. As you know from the Panabianco study, men with a negative MRI still harbor some degree of disease, but those cases are all low-grade disease. Where do we set our threshold for who should be biopsied and who should be treated? That is still unclear at this time, but this at least lays a foundation for a future paradigm to evolve. If it did evolve, there's 67% of men who have clinically significant images should undergo a fusion biopsy in combination with a standard 12-4 biopsy. At this time, a targeted biopsy alone is not a replacement for the standard of care. You have just completed part one of what a urologist should know about prostate imaging. Please feel free to tweet at us if you have any questions. For additional information, you can please visit our website. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel for any additional updates and new course material.